Oh yeah, we're in person. Welcome to the Open Mic Pain with Anthony and Wayne Podcast. Well, here you go. All right. Today is Bill fucking Burr Day. Bill Burr, the goat. The goat. In my eyes. Yeah. It's got to be. Justin sent us that video earlier, the Bill Burr writing one. Did you watch it? Not yet. No. It's pretty good. He basically talks about um, Justin saying that he wants to do or he does writing like Bill Burr. And Bill Burr talks about writing in the sense of he um, goes on stage and just riffs. So um, takes an idea, riffs on stage, writes on top of the the riff and keeps breaking it down from there. Which we've talked about before, but it's like, wish we had the luxury for that. Mm. I, I often wonder what it would be like being able to go up multiple times, not just in a week, but maybe in a day. Yeah. To like really work on something. When I was talking to Jacques about him going out to uh, Los Angeles. Mm. Oh, not Los Angeles. Was it LA? Yeah, it was yeah. in LA. Yeah. And he was saying that he was hitting like four or five ni- uh, mics in a day. And he would start with like, he started a new joke. And then as the time went on, as the day went on, it was like completely different. Cause he changed a little bit every time. Yeah. That's how you write, man. That sounds so awesome. That's the key. Yeah. We just got to suck less enough that people start letting us go up all the time. Like, I wonder, like, I wonder like, uh, like Steve there for uh, that's a winter circle. Wonder, Steve York. Yeah. I wonder how many places he can just go into that. It's a real club and just be like, I'm popping in tonight. More. I bet it's a lot because like you, I mean he's a he's a headliner so I'm sure I'm sure there's a, a luxury there uh, or at least a, like a like a courtesy for yeah. somebody like that a professional working comedians thing mm-hmm. oh fuck man that's what we need yeah so Portland today Bill Burr what are you excited about I think this is gonna well this won't be the first comic that we've seen since we started doing stand-up. No. But being further in, being further in and, and having having what we learned since we went and saw the, the Kreischer Festival, it's going to be interesting watching Bill Burr from a different perspective than just a fan mm. um, and really kind of seeing what he did. Like, you know, a lot of people go, I see what he did there. That's clever. But it's different when you're really thinking about how to, make something work or make something be funny or get that uh, misdirection or whatever. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to, to listen in from that perspective. But on the other side of it, he is my number one. He's my favorite. I, I love everything Bill Burr does, and uh, I've never seen him before. So uh, Segways, pauses, how he gets into other things. Like I, I know we're going to be paying attention to that a lot more. Because every time I watch like a really good comic now, that's, that's my number one goal is just to see, like, how do you string it together? Because mm-hmm. we wrote, write a million jokes, but I feel like, um, especially we went to the burn the other night for Justin. And Congrats, by the way. Justin won. <laughs> Fucking amazing. Four people in the crowd to see him, and, and he, uh, out of a room of probably, what, 40? Minimum. Yeah, there was, there was at least 40 people there, and... It was maxed out. People were standing in front of the door that was open yeah. uh, and closed. Yeah, he, he murdered. Uh, you know, it did the best there. Thing. There were a lot of funny people there. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There was a couple people in the, in the beginning, at least um, at least one. So one good comic in the beginning. Uh, and, you know, obviously, Janet's yeah, awesome. Um, she was really funny, too. She, oh, man, I want to say the joke that she has on air, but I've been repeating it to everybody. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you after, but yeah, she's such a funny joke about being an accountant in the beginning. Uh, but there's oh, a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's another kid there, too. Um, Josh? Was that his name? The young, the college kid? I don't remember. I think his name was Josh. He was really good. And my point to this is, like, the segues that they put together were, yeah, it was, they did seven-minute sets, and they were both people who did their seven-minute sets that were comics there. It wasn't like, I would say, like, me, where... Mine is five minutes of five different jokes that I try to segue into in and out of. And I kind of have, to, like, if you listen to one part of the joke, uh, you don't have to listen to the rest of it. It might just be a, a one-off type of thing. But I feel like all of theirs were just a continuous story. Uh, yeah. And they kept it funny throughout. I'm a little jealous of that because that's a hard way for me to write. I write, like, punchline and then try to put a joke around it and then try to, like, write a segue into another one. 
And uh, I think a good comic probably does that, but when you watch it, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like it's all one continuous story. Yeah, I tried doing that with my um, my ten minutes that I did at um, uh, Andy's Neighborhood Canteen, hmm. where I start off with uh, you know VHS tapes, go into streaming, then go into TikTok, and but it is like you can kind of see that progression. It's not as stream streamline you know what i mean mm -hmm. like maybe from from tiktok to sucking dicks it is kind of, it's not really a stretch but it's just like you start off with tiktok why are you at tiktok i'm watching this video what about that video the guy said he wouldn't suck a dick yeah and then it goes but in between it, it, it there's there's really a um a talent in a really good segue where you don't even know that they segued yeah I've been thinking about that a lot more when I have jokes that are similar that I'm obviously going to group together. I, I want to make them feel like they were one joke, like trying to have a girl, uh, Benny talking for the first time. Um, what else? I got all kinds of, all kinds of, oh yeah, discharge, sperm whale. Like all mm -hmm. those bits are kind of the same vein that I feel like I could do together and make it feel like it's a individual joke. Because uh, speaking of Bill Burr, I remember... You sent me the Bill Burr five minutes. Remember yeah, that? his type five. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all one premise. I wonder if those were individual jokes at one point, or if that was just all one thing. God damn, but it was so good. It was really good. He he's a master. He really is a master at it. I'm I'm so pumped. I've been. I can't believe the day is here. I felt like when we got the tickets, it was about four or five months ago. Yeah, there we go. So it's been a long wait, and it's fucking here. I'm pumped. Yeah, it's really cool. Like that's oh man, such a cool level of comedy to hit where you can just go and be like, yeah, I'm going to do eight shows this year. And they'll be in September and October. And I'll just do a stadium or arena four nights in a row. And I'll be it. And he's just going to make his years worth of a jillion dollars doing that. Mm -hmm. And hell yeah. Yeah, go for it. I wonder what it's like. It was, so it's a different effect to do an arena obviously Bert Kreischer was saying recently that because he was doing the fully loaded tour so much he couldn't figure out what was funny so he needed to like uh, Tom Segura recommended he does stops of uh, clubs in between where you actually get feedback that yeah. said so the arenas you can say anything and you're getting you know we've talked about Steve Martin stopping comedy because that would be it. He, he went up and he did a bunch of stuff that he knew wasn't funny to kind of test the theory and people were laughing at it. And he's like, this isn't fun anymore because, you know, they just laugh at anything I say. I know right now though, we're like fucking 12 year old boys figuring out. I'm like, I don't care why you laugh. I'll take it. I will take that laugh. It's funny. You mentioned uh, Chrysler going to arenas and things like that. I was really uh, thinking about this the night we went to the Burren. I went to Tavern at the End of the World in Cambridge. Mm. And it was that is a place where and we did an episode on it. There's a, a room where the comedy is going on, but it's attached by a very large opening to the bar. And it was fucking loud. Like, it was very loud. And um, maybe... I don't know. It was fun for a different reason. We talked about how going up to um, when I went, when I went up to Wicked Funny in front of sixty plus people and telling jokes and hearing the laughs that was fucking amazing. Mm. But going into the tavern at the end of the world and going up and there's thirteen people listening to you and then a bar that's just fucking loud. It was fun for some reason as well because over those loud people you hear the spatterings of laughter of people actually paying attention. And that was kind of a fun experience too. But then you go see Justin performing at the Burr and, and it's like, man, this is kind of where you want to be, but they're, they're fun for different reasons. Yeah. The burn needs a couple things fixed too. Uh, they did that stupid fucking Their microphone The microphone. So cutting in and out. First of all, I had to have known on stage that was happening. Got to talk about it. Got to talk about your your mic. Now. Oh yeah, I'm gonna tell you right now. So we're doing it next week. Yeah. If I win, I might just give Janet back the fifty and say, "Fix your microphone." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, all she needs is a cord. I feel yeah, like they just have like, a bad cord. Maybe I'll just bring one. <laughs> exactly. You just bring an aux cord and it should be just fine. Yeah, 
And also, it's I don't know how you fix it. Well, I guess you could fix it by turning on the fucking music in the front bar. But that door opening, that's a lot of music coming in and out in between your set. That's Luckily, that didn't happen as, as much as the time went on. Yeah, it didn't. Exactly. In the beginning, it was a lot. But as um, people didn't tend to leave until sets were over. Yeah, I feel like huge advantage going later in that show. So I wonder where we're going to be piled into it. Yeah, re- recency bias for sure. Hmm. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Because Justin got undeniably the best applause to throughout the most laugh uh, as far as the guys yeah. that were doing the competition goes and all that. So his was 100% merit. I just, you want to set yourself up to do it in the right light. Like you don't want to go first and then no one remembers what you did or something like that. Or yeah. that people opening and closing the door all the time or that be lame. I will say everybody that was part of the actual competition was very good. With the exception of one person who I was, I was just wasn't a fan of, but I give him credit because he went up there with confidence, and um, I'll never knock anybody for going up and, and doing their thing. Just because I don't find it funny doesn't mean it's not funny. He was getting laughs, but it just wasn't for me. I'll knock him in a competition. You're in a competition, bitch. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> like if he's just doing a regular set, that's fine. But goddamn, go up there with some shit planned, please. I was, I, I was very su- uh, not surprised. I was happy to see Terrence. Uh, we've seen him at the yeah, safe a few times. Yeah, he's great. But I haven't seen him enough to like really know his material and I had a fucking blast listening. He had me he had me rolling. He was I was worried about not not worried. I would have been happy if he won too. Um but when it came to it, I was like, Man, Justin's got some competition with this guy. <laughs> his stuff was pretty good. Yeah, he was definitely my second favorite on that, that's for sure. So yeah, we're doing it next week. That's gonna be fun. Um like I almost wish we didn't fucking go on Wednesday. Because we just saw how awesome that it could be. That doesn't mean it's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we could walk out of there with our thumbs in our ass. <laughs> yeah, there, well, there could be five people there, and they could be talking at the bar, and uh, Janet could be in a bad mood because of it, and we could just bomb. Yeah. That's probably going to happen. I was actually thinking about that on the ride home. I was like, man, next week there's going to be nobody there. <laughs> it's going to suck. <laughs> That's okay, though. It's Because that, that happens every time we go somewhere. Like yeah, like we'll we'll miss the safe, and then Ren will post a picture, and it's like a hundred people. Mm. They're all like locked in, and then we'll go like the next week. Like man, we should probably go there, and it's like nobody there. Yeah, well, or we're Tempo just... Bistro. Okay, the, yeah. the week we went there, the week before, Danny posted. He's like, yeah, we had trivia, and like thirty people stayed, and we went, and there was seven of us. <laughs> it was all comics. Yep. And four of them left after their first set. <laughs> the only customers that we had were like 25 yards away from us. They're like, hey, cunt. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. Well, I mean, make sure appreciate the good ones. It was, yeah, um, sure. I think it was Louie on Rogan or Rogan by himself. One of the two. He was talking about like his whole comedy career was just based on nuggets like the, of of experience mm-hmm. like you he would open mic a bunch and it'd be monotonous and feel like he's not getting anywhere and then one comic would be like hey man you're really fucking funny he'd be like lenny clark or one of those guys and be like yes yes and it would keep him going like i feel like a very similar <laughs> thing could be happening you know with us like that, that's like these shows that we get now like going to the burn or wicked funny or any of that shit it's like a it's like a nugget of like this is why you do it yeah I, you know, I, I really appreciate people that will actually come up and, like, give you a fist bump and say, hey, that was really funny. Like, the laughter is awesome, but there's something about a peer-to-peer uh, compliment. Um, I try to make sure I tell every – I try to fist bump everybody I can because, you know, it it takes something to go up there and put yourself on the line and uh, talk for five minutes in front of people trying to be funny. Um, <laughs> but if I find somebody really funny, I try to seek them out and, like – like, hey man, that was fucking awesome. Because I, I love when somebody does that to me. And I know that that's kind of like there are people that won't do that, particularly because it's not cool. Like there's a whole group of people that we see at the open mic the whole time that are sitting in the back, they're talking, going up their set, they're leaving, and they're not really doing much in between. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you feel like that's you, it probably is. So <laughs> don't do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and those guys, you're not getting, you know, you're going there to learn if your shit's good. You only get that from talking to people. How many times do you do a set, you're like, 
felt good at the time, and but nobody talked to you about it, so you don't know if you got anything out of it. Or we have Jacques there, and you get off, and he comes over, and he like says your set back to you, and all the things he likes, and what he didn't like, and gives you a high five. It made you feel good. I remember Jacques the first time I went to the safe. He came over, and he, he was like, "Oh man, that was an awesome set, good job." And I never met him. I'm like, I like you 50 percent more than everybody else here now. So that's a good move too. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's a good move just to make friends because if you tell somebody their set's good, they're like, I love you. Yeah. It's a good move to make friends and, and also network and you know, like just be a decent person. Just support each other. You know? I'm much more tolerable of bad comedy now than I was before I started comedy. Isn't that weird? Yeah, because you realize how hard it is. Yeah, and it's like I realize that everybody likes different shit so much. Like some I get mad sometimes at what people find funny. Um, you and all your memes. <laughs> Your fucking face off memes. <laughs> Come on. All those you didn't like Dobby <laughs> the no. Michael Jackson Dobby face. That's uh, yeah. so awesome, dude. I, I, just, I thought like if it was Dumbledee he, you know what I'm saying? Like if it was so, Dumbledore. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you did something like that where it like kind of flowed better, fine. See? What do you mean Dobby? Dobby he <laughs> <laughs> I had to hear you say it. <laughs> uh but yeah, it makes me really mad that you find that funny. And <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. Now I can come to grips with it and uh, more enjoy the people who I don't think are funny at all, mm -hmm. just based on, all right, is it a good joke? And sometimes, and man, there was this one guy, Justin almost died watching him when we went to Booking Bar. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that guy. Because we did almost a couple days before watching him at a different right. place. Yeah. Because uh, it, was, it was painfully hilarious. My favorite part was he was like, "Why are you guys so tense?" <laughs> <laughs> he was yelling at the crowd, "Why they're so tense?" Whilst he was the tensest person in the entire mm -hmm. room, it was so funny. Like I, that's almost like uh, Andy Kaufman, fucking Jim Carrey stuff, right there. Like maybe he's, mm. maybe he's a genius. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, that guy. God damn. But, I mean, this is the stuff. Hmm. This is the time where all the comics later are like, those were the days where you would just see the craziest shit. Yeah, I, you know, I almost don't envy, like, touring comics because they don't get these fun... The hang. Like, you're not, yeah, you don't get the hang. You're not going to... Like, it's like 90% of going to an open mic is you're hanging out with your friends and then 10% of it's you're going up on stage. Well, I wonder, so the road is going to be broken down, I guess, into two pieces, and that's you are a, like, just starting out headliner. I think that the road is mostly you going to places and then giving you locals to open for you. Mm -hmm. This is this is what I hear um, when I was listening to the, this is an incredible thing, it's Shane Gillis' podcast there, the Gillian Keeves. I've never listened to it. Yeah, it's called uh, Shane and, and whatever, Secret Time Podcast, or whatever the fuck those do. Uh, Shane and Matt's secret podcast. And they started it when they were open micers. So that's really fucking cool. So if you go back far enough, you can actually like hear them during that time. And they don't talk about like, it's not like an open mic based show. They're just shooting the shit like we are now. But they talk about things that they go to. And Shane later, when he was just starting the headline, talked about going to Boston and uh sitting in a panera bread for nine hours waiting for the show to start and then going there and it's just boston comics he doesn't know and people opening for him and he has to drive from there back to philadelphia right after the show where it was like six hours oh, look at that live show no difficulties sorry right. there we go you can edit it where i won't <laughs> is it we should probably mention why we're like looking off camera oh yeah we're in person, <laughs> we're in person. All right, watch look, look at this look at this ready ready watch this shit you ready everybody look at, look at <laughs> <laughs> and there's the opening <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're in person I, that's how i demonstrated that yeah yeah, so that's the point. I think when you first start headlining, the road might be a sadder place in that regard. But then I think when you start drawing really good in an area, I imagine you can start bringing your own openers. So yeah. then you're bringing your buddies up with you and you're having a good time hanging out all day and doing cool shit like that. And that's yeah. going to be a blast. Jump with your family. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs that? Who needs that? <laughs> yeah, but right now, it seems. Does it seem like to 
the um, all right. It, Nick's Comedy Stop, Giggles, Kowloon's, Laugh Boston, um, and a theater every once in a while is an opener. That style of comic, meaning uh, you're there every weekend going to these clubs. You can make, you know, the money's not the thing, but let's say you were doing sets. But like you were Louis when he was making two grand a week doing comedy in Boston type of thing that around. Does mm-hmm. that feel even a possibility in your head as you're doing uh, stuff like that? Or do you go like, that's a dream. I don't even know how that even makes sense. Like, how do you even get to that level? I can see the path to that. I can see the path to it. I'm not saying I have the talent to do it. I can't even see the path. I can see it. I mean, once again, it's all networking. It's, you know, I know, but to consistently be turning over and doing those shows and making the money and doing all that and being an echelon above when again, it's more subjective in it. It was everything. I mean, there's the cream of the crop and that always rises to the top, like the, the best of the best comics. But those guys who are just doing those shows and all that, like the you go to giggles and what, whoever's in the lineup, five of them, you're going to like five of them. You're going to think are kind of shitty. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can see, I, yeah. It's gonna go back. I, I can see that path. I don't know that I'm talented enough, but I would. I would like to do that. That is a that is a possibility. That is fun, or sounds fun. Because um, we talked about how fun it is being in front of a group that's there to see comedy, and while there are two different funs, being at an open mic, being at a dive bar where people are talking over you, and then that. I think the more fun is just performing in front of people that are actually there to see you. Um, well, so another could... thing on Bill Burr real quick, cause it goes with you is in that video he was talking about earlier. He, yeah, in the beginning of my career, he's like, you know, I was like eight years in, I was doing this thing over there and I was thinking like eight years. In, yeah, like, I'll be retired by then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that was the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So that's crazy to think about too, or he said he was opening for um, David Hell in New York eight years in. and now Bill Burr is a Boston comic first couple of years he's open mic and all that the thing about and he said that he stuck ass on for a long time until he you know five years or whatever until he started really doing shows but that's why I keep going I think is the tantalizing horizon of that. like oh man I just want to be five years in just let me do this for five years and just see what it's like yeah. maybe I'm in New York once a month doing that for people yeah, I mean, you say that it's going to be here before you know it because here we are. I actually looked up the dates because uh, I I watched I watched both of our first sets ever. <sighs> that was it, was, gross. it was uh, it was horrible. I can't believe you did that. Um, but uh, at the date, it was uh, it was the twelfth of March in this, for you, and I think it was the sixteenth of March for me. So it, it feels was like four it, days later. Yeah, it was you oh, went on Sunday, Sunday and I went on a Thursday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's crazy how I got you to like that because we did you know I was going to go up or did I surprise you? No, because I was I I uh, finished everything I was doing. My wife was putting my son to bed, and I texted you. I think I forget what we were playing at the time. We were playing some game. Dark yeah, might have been like Dark, I think it was Dark Souls three. Actually, I think we were replaying Dark Republican Souls Republican game. Yeah, the Republican game. It made no sense. It made no sense. Drop that joke. God damn. Um, but yeah, I texted you. I was like, "Hey, you wanna you wanna play some Dark Souls?" And you just sent me a picture of a, of the stage, and I was like, "Oh shit!" Have I meant? Did I mention before that that I was gonna do that? No. Oh, wow, that was good. No, you me. kept that completely secret. I did. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, there were. Um, I told everybody at work it would be six months until in my life. They were like, "Oh, when can we come see you?" I'm like, six to eight months. That's when it's gonna take me to work through and get something I'm proud of. And here it is. And people are going to see on when I go to the burn. I well, I think that people are uh, coming by to watch it. So that'd be the first time I'd ever have people like going there to see me at a thing. And I was right. That's how long it takes. Yeah, yeah. Before I'm cool with it, at least. Because could you imagine the first month someone there going to see you? Ugh. Yeah, I was. I was. I've seen people bring people. Uh, on their first time and it seems like an awkward thing especially because like you're not going to be good your first time the only exception is spencer from reality tonic po- podcast i was there the first time he went on stage and he blew me away that when i was in uh, england was it that no there was just some other night uh you couldn't make it for some reason and uh i talked to him briefly beforehand 
and I found out it was his first time on stage. And I was I was tired. I wanted to go home, but he was like two comics ahead. And I was like, I'm gonna stay and support this guy. And as soon as he's off stage, I'm fucking leaving. <laughs> but he he did his five minutes, and um, it wasn't like the most polished, obviously. But he had me die. I was laughing so hard. Like he was wicked funny. Yeah, that's that's an energy thing too for the safe because the safe is so good at that. It's kudos to him. For a kick and ass, but two researching open mics properly before he went to yeah. pick a good one to start on. Mm-hmm. Like man, the safe. Imagine both of us went to the safe where we both went to pretty hard mics to get laughs at for our first time. Like yeah. Strange Brew going nineteenth and me going into Portland with all the blue hairs. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a tough first go around. Uh, sure is. Sp- speaking of our first, uh, are we ever going to do the episodes? Where we it will do an episode for each of us where we actually listen to our first and then uh, kind of dissect it. No, and watch the other one squirm. No, I can't. I can't even fathom doing that right now. Like I could see if I'm at like Tom Segura's level where I'm like, hey, you can't even make fun of me because of how good I am now. So let's watch this old thing and all laugh together. Now I'm like, oh, that was like a couple months ago. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's impressive how how much we've grown. In, it's in, so different in, in just a couple months. Yeah, I was talking to somebody uh, the other day, and they were talking about like, "Oh, do you like how does how do you get better at it?" And I'm like, "One, you got to just do it. But two, this is the perfect way to describe it. Is it's like all it is is you get. It's, it sounds very obvious, but it's not till you think about it. Talking to people for five minutes to ten minutes to fifteen minutes is a skill that you can get really good at." You just think like, oh, I'm good at talking. I'm that's innate. I'm either good at talking or I'm bad at talking. It's like, no, we've met some people who are like extremely difficult to talk to off stage that can put it together on stage and put a great set together. Yeah, because it's literally only about repetition. That's why when almost almost anybody, there are a couple of people that I'm like, stop doing comedy. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part, almost anybody that goes up there, you can start to see like the cracks in their set where you can put glue in and fix and you're like they're gonna fix that they're gonna move stuff over like um like not big cracks but just like as people get better like dan cronin who's awesome he's getting uh that tag that we talked about on the the m&ms and skills joke that he had there Mm, it was just like oh man like i know that's the perfect bit there and you're gonna fucking that's you constructed a joke that was all around it. He has all the bones, all the pieces to make awesome comedy. He yeah, does, obviously. Uh, but you could just see him getting better by filling in those uh, taglines. And then there's some people that you start seeing do their sets, and you're like, you have nothing. <laughs> I, I, it blows my mind. I see some people that are very funny. Um, their jokes are very funny. But I saw them the first or second time we went out, and then I saw them, let's say, last week, and it's the same exact stuff and i don't say it's a bad thing because you have to do repetition i'm still doing tiktok and dad's old porn and all this stuff but it's changing as i do it oh yeah yeah, but but like if you watch somebody six months ago and then you see them today and i can mouth the words to their joke i'm kind of curious like why are you going to open mics to do this? Like, why aren't you working i I don't know i was about to disagree with you until you said that because i was going to say like oh repeat every night the same shit if you want because I don't know what you're working on. You might be working on a special, you might be working on a, a, a set for the burn or something where you're like, I have to get the repetition in. And if you've been doing comedy for five years, you might look at six months like we look at two weeks right now. We're yeah, just kind of like, this is what I'm working on over the next six months. And they really refine it and break. Like Louie, if you're talking about Louie Rogan, all the guys are doing headliner hours, the first whatever six months to a year of writing, they're just putting together an hour, basically, and they're repeating the same shit every week. Oh, yeah. it down, bringing it down, bringing it But changing all the time. I guarantee you, you listen to any of them, and six months later, their stuff's not exactly the same. It's yeah. Change. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now I now I agree with you. Fuck those people. I mean, I don't care. You know, it's, they're open mics. Do whatever you want to do. That's that's what it's there for. But. I just I often wonder because I you know you see some of these people and you're like man they got some really funny stuff, but why aren't they writing more of it? It's really hard to be in the moment. I think you have to be on stage in the moment to write as you're on stage. If you're just performing your set and you can do it in your shower or you can do it on stage and it really doesn't matter, then I think that you're not going to be able to put that feedback from the crowd to good use. Mm-hmm. 
bring up Justin again. Another thing I'd give Justin a shout out for is reinforcing how much that we need to stay in the moment on stage. Like he's very good at. I've never seen him say a joke the same way twice. But you know, sometimes you got to tailor it in and do it more similar so you can actually build on top of it and not do something completely different. Yeah. But it's a, it's a benefit to be so in the moment that if anything changes in the atmosphere, he uses it to enhance the joke. And that's a great way to write. You know, that's what Bill Burr talked about for writing. So that's I'm trying to be a little bit more that way on stage where I'm just I'm trying to say the joke to you like I'm telling it to you at work, um, like we're co-workers and it's a funny story. And I want you to think it's funny. Not like, hey, I've said this a million times. Here's the, the punchline. Bang. And I've noticed that I, I'm pulling a lot more tags from that. Yeah. Uh, that I kind of had that feeling when I went to a tavern. I did TikTok. And um, I, I was doing kind of the same thing. I was just up there just almost like talking to people about it. Like you're saying, I wasn't telling them a joke. I was talking to them about the subject. And it was mainly because there were people talking at the bar and there were these two ladies up front. And I was like, you know what? I'm telling you guys the joke. So we were, you know, I started talking to them a little bit and they went through it. And I feel like it went for what it was being you know, the 10, 13 people there trying to listen while there was a, a wave of sardines packed in the, uh, the bar. But uh, I feel like it went, way better than it would have if I just went up there like I was p pressing repeat or taking the, the record needle over and we'll start again. Yep, yep. Well, that makes sense. I'm just... I'm very happy now. I'm trying to think of a good analogy for this. It's almost like, you know when something's a complete mystery to you of how it works and then you just see a little bit behind the scenes of how it's made and it, yeah. it strikes away the illusion and you can enjoy it more because you understand how, how it works. So that's like... Playing guitar. When I learned how to play guitar, it was incredible mystery to me how they move their hands that way, how it works. Like, that's, are you born with that skill? How the hell do you put that together? And then you do lessons for just like a couple months, and you're like, okay, I see why the best guys are the best. I see how you learn, how you get to that. And I'm starting to get that way in comedy where before, I think I've said it before, but I saw Tom Segura in uh, Hampton beach mm -hmm. uh once and was it at the ballroom at the ballroom yeah and we accidentally sat in a row of seats that you got a meet and greet with afterwards like i didn't even know that we're on there but i had like a note on the seat saying stick around afterwards or whatever and we met him which was cool so you didn't pay for it you just got it yeah no, I just came with it. Fucking awesome. well i mean it was probably like part of the seat package i just was picking the seat based on where it was in the, the thing. oh okay yeah, yeah. It just happened to come with it, i guess um, i remember that picture i remember when you sent that to me i was so jealous yeah, like he, you all had like the fist out. Like, yeah, he was really cool too. He was, yeah. he was uh, I mean, you know, did he, he tell you how famous he was? That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> so, one of the jokes he had in the middle, which struck me at the time, because I really thought about it, was he was um, he was just talking about uh, a bit, and he's walking around. And he goes, you know, people think they could do things. Like right now, look what I'm doing. You can't do this. And he said, though, I, you probably heard it in a special because he yeah. says it in a special. I'm butchering it, but the emphasis is look what I'm doing. There's no way you can do this. And I remember sitting there going, Oh, he's right. Like, I don't even know how you do that. That's the whole to talk like this and have that kind of funny in it. I wasn't mm -hmm. thinking about joke writing at the time. I wasn't thinking about how to put together an hour. I was just experiencing comedy as like somebody would normally do. And it seemed mystical. And then now, as I'm doing, I mean, obviously we're not Tom Segura, but I can see how you can be Tom Segura. Like, I can see the step. Of, like, I did it every day for 15 years, and you got good at telling stories. Like, there's not much more around it than that, but. Do you think, do you think if if you were to see, uh, so let's go back to, like, when I, when I did Wicked Funny. I went up there, I told the jokes I told, and people laughed, right? Yeah. Do you think that in that same scenario, let's just say Tom Segura happened to walk in, okay? And Mike was like, go on up. If he did my exact set, do you think he would get the same laughs? The, people, the same exact way I did it, the same exact way I said it. Do you think that he would get the same laughs, or do you think people would say, uh, you're a professional comedian, you need to be funnier? Oh, uh, so they know it's Tom Segura? I mean, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, let's assume that most of them know it's Tom Segura. 
Do you think they would? And this isn't. A, this well, you're a caveating it by saying he's going to do it with the same skill level as you. Not, Not the same skill, skill just like saying it the same, the same, same words. Maybe, maybe he'll say it a little differently. And he's going to kill and like way more. You think so? Yeah, because I, I, I literally, this is how I look at comedy now, and I, I think I'm right on this. It's like building a fucking chair. It's like being a woodworker on a chair setup. Where you go right now, we can build a chair, but somebody else can look at the wood that we used to do that, the piece of maple we started with, and went. Oh, they have something that I could have made a way better chair out of, but they're learning. Mm -hmm. He just, we don't have those skills yet to make that nice of a chair. I think he would take your block of wood, your premise, uh, and that idea, and he would sell it so much better because we can't, we can't sell like he can. You know, he's just going to go up there. It's going to feel natural. It's going to have no inflection points. He's not going to start again on any line. He's going to uh, be conversational. He's going to get improv from the crowd out of it. But you know, the difference is, is, um, I feel like it's a, like at a football game, the decibel meter that they give in between where they're trying to get the crowd loud, the crowd yeah. the thing. I feel like we get to like 75% of that at best in there, but we're like, people are like, oh, that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. But there's like a feeling over on your seat, falling over, belly laughing, roar that a room can get that um, I'm not saying we can't get that, but I think to get and sustain that in a room takes you got a couple years of really going. Yeah. Like, um, like Mike K there, uh, when I watched him open your guy's set, there was just a way where I felt like he was holding the crowd up. Like he, like he was like, ah, I'm doing this on purpose. I know where, how you're going to react, and I'm going to bring it up, and I'm going to bring it down. Your conductor almost. Yeah, yeah, Bring yeah. up the horns. And I feel like we do that by accident. Like every <laughs> – we get we're like, ah, see, that was funny, right? <laughs> but, yeah, that like that's cool to – like, before I was like, you either have Tom Segura special for a reason, and that's true. But um, I'm more just go out there and make reps, do repetitions, and I think you're going to fucking be able to do your own version of that. Mm -hmm. It just takes time. If you're building chairs, even the most fucking simple jack of people are going to eventually build a nice chair if you give them enough time. Yeah. Well, you know what they say, you give a monkey a typewriter, and at some point he'll eventually write Shakespeare. Yeah. Even if they're retarded, like simple jacks. Yeah, have you seen Tropic Thunder? <laughs> what is it? Tra Tropic Thunder? Jeez, yeah, when it, when it like first came out on DVD was the last time yeah, I watched simple it. Simple Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that movie. That's my. That movie is so. Like, I want to show it to someone who's like 18 years old right now and watch them create lawsuits out, out of the <laughs> how fucking unwoke that movie is. Dude, I work with a kid who's 21 years old, and I will make a reference to something. And just like the glazed over look. I, I said something about Boy Meets World the other day. And this kid's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, you've never seen Boy Meets World? Yeah. Like, how does somebody not watch that? I know, because I felt like when we were kids, someone was like, oh, like All in the Family or any of these shows. I'm like, yeah. I know. They're old. I know the show. Cosby Show. I know those shows. Yeah. I'm not like fucking, I know Cosby Show. I like even more now. I wanna, <laughs> I'm trying to make a bit about liking an artist's art more if they're a piece of shit. Because like, we used to do that, like Picasso. He spent so much time doing heinous shit. How did he have time to write such good comedy? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it a little bit. Like, people liked Picasso's art because of how much of a crazy asshole he was. It wasn't like he was, they were like, wow, that guy's so cool. Look at him. <laughs> Cutting his ear off. I want to look at his painting now. That was some Picasso. Yeah. That was Van Gogh. Cut his ear off. Oh. Fuck. Yeah, P Picasso, though, he was a crazy, crazy fuck. Crazy there was a story. There was a story. He, Picasso was not that old. You know, he lived in, like, I think he died in, like, the 70s. I knew it was the 1900s, but yeah. I mean, yeah, I he, know he, name, no, so. he, so there was a story I read. I don't know if it, how true it is, but he but went in to get a coffee himself. somewhere, and he didn't have any money on him. So he got the coffee, and he took a napkin and drew out. Drew something and just said, I'm Picasso. Here you go. Took the copy and left. <laughs> See? And nowadays, they would have been like, he took advantage of me in this coffee shop. <laughs> and he put his will and his exert power over me. And then they'd cancel him. What would be the co the uh, comic equivalent of that? Like, oh, here's your here's your bacon, egg, and cheese. They're like, hey, uh, I got haunted by a gay ghost. And uh, he lubed up my, my, he lubed up my stool legs. See you later. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's like sixty bucks. I won't take the change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, 
if you have that napkin that he drew that on and that's real and that guy's not faking that, that's worth a billion dollars. So oh, yeah. He was right. Yeah. I have more than paid for the coffee. But yeah, no, people used to be cunts and we used to love them for it. But now you, people make you feel bad for liking anybody that's had a problem. Like Louie. And when his special sorry came out, everybody's like, oh, well, why is he going back to work? And, and why are you, if you're supporting him? Listen, like, again, Picasso, Van Gogh, sorry, Van Gogh, cutting his ear off, doing all kinds of crazy shit. Everybody loves the guy because we're just focused on the art. You know what I'm saying? Like Hitler drew beautiful pictures of German shepherds. <laughs> did he? <laughs> yeah, he did. You've never seen the German art? No. Uh, the Hitler art? Oh, my God. Um, man, I wish we had a Jamie to pull up a picture of it. but he. Did. I'll do that on my work computer on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love how I was like, Hitler, you're like, oh, my God, why can <laughs> say you appreciate the art of Hitler? Uh, I'm not done. Well, look at the German Shepherds he drew. They yeah. were beautiful paintings. He was, he was also extremely cool. high on coke all the time. Yeah. Did you see the videos? Like... No, I was methamphetamine. Was, was it meth? Yeah. Oh, that was coke. They oh, invented it back then. He was like, oh, this is fucking tits. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't condone Hitler. Uh, so let's start there. But I'm just saying, if you can draw a good picture of a dog, you're yeah. all right. <laughs> I think he had the right idea, just the wrong people. <laughs> Who's the joke that? Huh? That's a joke from somebody. Me. Hey, I told you that months ago, yeah. I just never did anything with it. Justin had a similar joke about something, but I won't, I won't spoil it. But he had a very similar uh, thing. But that, that was uh, that's something that's been in my, in my notebook for a while. And yeah, just, I don't know. Yeah, no, he's a dick. Jewish people are cool. Jews are tight. Uh, except I went to a brewery the other night, and this girl, she's like, I'm a Jew. And then she shat all over me. And I was like, damn. Mm. I don't like the Jews now. That's how it happens, you know. It's like a one personal attack. And then you just hate the people of another race. Like, I hate I hate Portuguese people. <laughs> I hate Portuguese people because of what I what I do to myself every day. I loved that uh, at, at my birthday that you went to. You started talking shit about Portuguese people. And my sister-in-law is Portuguese, and she didn't know you were Portuguese. And she was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, I, I have a, that's part of my immigrant parents bit. But the idea is that the most racist people in the world are immigrants or people with immigrant backgrounds. But they're just racist against themselves. They're never, like, racist against, uh, like, I got a kid that works with me. He's Puerto Rican. And he's like, these motherfucking words I can't say about <laughs> his own people. Yeah. And, you're, and it's tough because, you know, old people will come in and be like, oh, I can say that now. You can't. Do you remember when we, we used to go to UFC all the time? Do you, do you remember Ed? Uh, he, he worked, he, he had a shop. Uh, he went to a UFC night with us and he brought his girlfriend at the time. Uh, so, so Ed was Spanish and she was Spanish as well. Yeah. Um, or Port- I don't know if she's Puerto Rican. I don't know. I don't know like what flavor of Spanish. She you've was. never called. I'll tell you this. I know this for a fact. You've never called someone Spanish and then been Spanish in your life from Spain. Yeah, you're you're one of That's those true. that you're just like, yeah, you're Spanish, right? And they're like, yeah, and the Indians are Indian. <laughs> I think she was Puerto Rican. She was awesome, but I, I had a couple. I had a couple uh, beers at the time, and I looked at her and I said, like, "Hey, can I ask you a question?" Because we started getting like we started talking. I got real comfortable. She's like, "Yeah, what's up?" It's like, how come when you guys speak English, you're like, talk normally? And then when you start speaking Spanish, you just fucking yell. And without missing a beat, she looked me in the eyes and goes, oh, no, honey, that's the Dominicans. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so awesome. I love that. That's the thing. That's what immigrants do. They're, they're just, they're tangentially racist. They're like anything that's around us. Like Portuguese people <coughs> hate Brazilians. Do they? <laughs> yeah, they do. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, they conquered Brazil. You know, that's how Brazilians are made. No, I know nothing about... Uh, Why are you sitting like that? I was going to go get a, a drink, but <laughs> you, you stopped your sentence a lot faster than I thought you were going to. <laughs> so I just pop right back in, like, hey. <laughs> no, I know nothing about the history of uh, South America. Because right, well, they're below us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, so <laughs> the Spanish people down south. <laughs> oh, no, my mic has been on mute that whole time. Was it really? Yeah, when I was since I've been coughing. Oh, uh, well, it's like 30 seconds, seconds, but I'm sure I picked it up. And sorry, everybody, we're probably going to cut this off. Okay, the Spanish people down south. Those people. Uh, they... <laughs> They were Indian. I just said Indians. Yeah, they were native South Americans. So, you know, Thanksgiving type ones. Uh, and the Portuguese went over there. And uh, some something, something, something. We had sex with a lot of them. And then Brazilians. <laughs> That's why they speak Portuguese down there. Oh, shit. Yeah. And then they got it back. We gave it back. I say we. I'm Portuguese and Brazilian. But I suppress my Brazilian stuff. Sure. Your mom's Brazilian? Yeah. But like that's the side that got conquered, so I never want to tell like someone's like, What are you? I'm like Portuguese. <laughs> not that other one. That other one's not tough. But they do have the fucking festival. Carnival. Never seen Carnival? It's like a festival. It's not Is that almost like a carnival? Yeah, it's like a carnival, but if they were like um they're praying to the god of ass. Like, that's the carnival that they are. Oh, shit. Yeah, Brazil. That's the highest echelon ass in the world. You ever seen the uh, Brazilian booty dance? Yeah, that's in Carnival, so they do that. Yeah? Yeah. That doesn't seem like something that they would, they would do in public all the time. Yeah, they are gross people. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't make the wax, though. I don't think they did. I think they were just like, those people are such chronic, like, <sighs> skanks that the... <laughs> Um, imagine, imagine, that. imagine being so good at something though that like you didn't invent it, but they name it after you. Like you just walk in somewhere, like I get a Brazilian. They know exactly where to wax you. Yeah, that does make sense. It's like if um like someone was gonna give you a lobotomy, brain damage, and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, this is called the uh, the Pakistanis, and you're like, man, are you just are they that good at being retarded that you name a fucking <laughs> lobotomy after them? That'd be rude. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The Pakistanis are some of the smartest motherfuckers in the world. Did you know that? Did you know that? That is where the birthplace of mathematics I think, is from that area. I'm bullshitting now because I said something mean about Pakistanis, but I'm just saying <laughs> I, I pulled them out of the air. <laughs> that, you know, I, this is a little off topic. Mathematics really like kind of fucks with my head. Like that's a truth, right? Like one plus one is always going to be two, but somebody had to figure that shit out. Well, don't say one plus one equals two. They had to figure that out because they just hold two coconuts on them. But with that, so I mean, like somebody, like this, some one of our ancestors had to look and go, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Then, <laughs> and, then eventually, they used that same math to determine the age of the universe. Yeah. And do you think you could have done that? Like, if you were back in the day, like before math existed, do you think you might have been the one that would go, okay, that's no one makes sense. sense. Yeah, but that is like. <laughs> No, but <laughs> not. no, I don't understand it now. People explain it to yeah, me. Exactly. You got calculators and shit. You still don't get it. No, because that's apparent when you go to like a market basket and the bill is like $21 and 97 cents and you give them 20, uh, 30 bucks and three cents and they don't know what to do with it <laughs> or whatever the, whatever the math is. That's wrong math. Actually, the math I did was wrong. <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah, my favorite thing to do to the guy at the gas station near me is um, the only math I'm good at is retail math because I've worked in a retail store for so long. So I'll get gas and I'll be like, uh, put like a Red Bull uh, on the counter. And I'll be like, all right, 535. And I'll be like, all right, put 1465 on pump because uh, I want to give him a $20 bill. And he's like, 1465 on pump two? What are you talking about? I'm like, just do it. It's like 20 even. It always blows the guy's mind. Like, oh my god! <laughs> ah, yeah, stupid motherfuckers. Yeah, and um, it's incredible to think about. Did you see that new pyramid shit that came out? No. So there's a uh, Randall Carlson, who's like a pyramid uh, old looker into her. Stupid fucking way to say that. Uh, he was on the Rogan podcast a bunch of times. Uh, he, he's the one that is pushing the younger dry impact theory, which is that the earth was bombarded with uh, some sort of catastrophe like 11,600 years ago. And there were actually like pretty sophisticated societies uh, before then, meaning that 
pushing back the age of when people were cognizant. They think now hundreds of thousands of years. We used to think people 5,000 years, that was the cutoff, and then they were hunter-gatherers for mm -hmm. the rest of the time before that. And we're finding out now that maybe 100,000 years people were high-impact societies, meaning that that's so much time that there could be people like more sophisticated than us uh, coming up and dying, and we would have no idea that they'd ever be around because like, if they made it out of plastic, it wouldn't be here anymore. 100,000 years, you wouldn't see it. Or shit like that or whatever. Um, but anyways, the recently, Randall Carlson brought out this guy, Malcolm Gladwell, I believe his name is, and he discovered a form of um, plutonium, no, sorry, plasma, plasmoid technology, blah, 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 using the frequency of the elements and plasma, they're able to use zero point technology that they think was how the Egyptians built the pyramids because it's something that you don't need. Like it doesn't follow our scale of evolution of uh, technology. Like it's not like a circuit board or any of that shit. Literally just bombarding plasma, which you can get naturally, you know, from the ground or whatever the fuck they, I don't know where you get plasma, but you can get plasma and put it through this vibration frequency, which that's what I think the pyramid was. It was like a, like a tuning fork for fucking uh, frequency. And if you know the element's frequency, how it moves, you can move shit with zero energy impact. So that's like how they'd be able to build the pyramid with the moving two ton stones of people. I don't know why I started talking about this, but super fucking interesting. That is wicked interesting. Yeah, he thought, like, uh, they're putting on experiments about it, showing people if they can crack zero point energy, we won't like, it'd be like, if you put this technology in your car, your car doesn't run on gas anymore. It would, instead of putting out carbon monoxide, it puts out oxygen. It's like creating uh, energy within itself. How it does it is it's by using that frequency so it builds up energy or some shit like that. Fucking wild. That's where you're going to get that knowledge. <laughs> you're going to get that knowledge. All right, what do you say we wrap this guy up? We got to go to Bill Burr. We do. We do. Yeah, this has been fun. Two more of these uh, non-plan. Not gonna say non-plan, but we don't have a plan topic. Yeah, we're, and we're in person. Find some fun directions. And person, yeah, and definitely a different energy when there's a. When it is our person. intention, I would say, eventually to have a little space where we can put three or four mics in and have people come to it and sit down in person and shoot their shit like this and just talk about comedy. But this is different. I don't know. We're gonna edit it, put it out see if it's better or worse than what we'd normally do. Cause this is like, normally we're doing like a show like we're talking to the camera or we have planned segments beforehand that we want to hit on. But is this more interesting? I just talked about the pyramids for five minutes. I can do it. Here. Um, yeah, I think, I think it is interesting. I mean, just kind of pull whatever threads come out, right? Yeah. Most of the time they're shitty. One thing uh, before we do wrap it up, I, I did want to mention to you because we have been talking about, and I'm not going to name names of anything, but we've been made a, been made aware of a particular comic that has uh, been utilizing a more tenured comics, uh, and by tenured comic, I mean somebody that's been on Comedy Central, probably towards nationally and all that stuff. Um, his persona, essentially, and we did we did a, an episode on parallel thinking versus joke thievery. This is a little different because he's not stealing the jokes. He's stealing the guy's, like, person. And I was curious. I, so I recognized this the first time I ever saw the guy about probably, like, five months ago. Um, he's actually a, went to school with a friend of mine, and the, that guy was there. He's like, hey, I know him. I went to school with him. And then when he got on stage and left, I was like, that is the same exact energy. You did call energy a mile as, away. as this guy. Yeah. And uh, I, you know. Who was I a month in to, to call anybody out or say anything or even bring it to his attention? Because maybe he didn't know, but it's pretty fucking spot on. But I was curious, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, versus not not stealing jokes, but stealing somebody's person. I'm actually really glad you brought that up because that, that is really interesting to talk about. So, do you know Joe Coy? I mean, I do. I, I, I've never listened to any of his stuff. Really, a little bit, little bits and pieces here, but I, I don't really. So he's uh, been a comic for a long time since the beginning of Dane Cook's career, and he tells a story. I hope it's Joe Coy now that I'm saying this, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, he tells a story how Dane Cook once went up to him and was like, you're stealing my essence right now. And it sounded ridiculous coming from Joe Coy's perspective because he's like, I'm Asian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, did you say it was Dane Cook said that to him? Yeah, like Dane Cook came up to me. He's like, you're not doing my jokes, but you're 
doing me. Like you're yeah. stealing my essence. And so from his perspective, Joe Coy was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm just being a comic. Like I, I'm happened to be wearing a t-shirt today. I'm sorry. Like, I know that you like to wear t-shirts, but I, yeah, yeah there's that kind of yeah. shit that he was worried about. So first I'm, I always take that angle where I'm like, are you being a pussy about what this guy's doing? Is he just kind of like, he's stealing something that's not like, he's not stealing something. He's just kind of similar to someone else. And guess what? There's going to be a lot of people. There's a lot of people that are like us out there for sure in our comedy. But this guy's different. <laughs> this guy is. So the person that he's stealing from is an incredibly unique comic. Like yeah, his he is, cadence. His, uh, yeah, his the inflections in his voice, the way he holds the mic, and his, his other hand, what he does with the other hand. And I'm trying to not be super obvious. I, I don't want to draw any attention. But I just thought it was an interesting topic of conversation. Um, but it is... It is something that is very particular. And he's not a super well-known comic. I know him from 20-something years ago watching Premium Blend and all that stuff. And I loved his comedy. Um, so that's the only reason that I, I picked up on it. But there's a difference because uh, you listen to Rogan. Uh, and uh, for the a millionth time, I'm going to mention him today. Uh, this is where I get my, my comedy knowledge. Fuck off, everybody. Um, He'll say something like, yeah, in the beginning, everybody's mimicking somebody. Like, you're just sounding like your favorite comic, and you try to work into your own voice. So that's one thing. And then there's, like, stealing a persona completely. I feel like there's a line there that, um, like, so I'm not saying this guy's doing that, but do you think he is? Like, I, it feels like the heat that he's getting, people think that. I think, I think that he might be. You think it's on purpose? Because it's so spot on. It's not like, oh, he does the thing with his hands or, oh, he does the vocal. It's No, he does both of them together in like the same exact way. And I don't see – that could almost be like parallel thinking in a way of like, okay, what if I do this? When you cross – parallel thinking is a two – like uh, there's joke thieving and parallel thinking and there's a line. And it's it, – when it, you're in thievery when that line is obviously crossed. Yeah, and I think this just feels like an obvious cross with all those things put together. Yeah, you gotta think what are the odds that the monkey wrote the fucking Shakespeare in the typewriter, or that somebody next to him wrote it, and the guy standing there doing the fucking typewriting? Yeah, it's a shame because I remember saying to my buddy, I was like, "Yeah, I think he was funny. He was very funny," but I can't get past the fact that he has the same exact act as this other guy. Do you think? Like, have you investigated to see if the jokes are the same in any of them? No, but I, I mean, the, so the the other guy is really not super well known. So I mean, if he is doing it on purpose, he picked a, a good one because he's well known enough where like it's funny and like he's it's obviously been successful. But if I were to tell you the name, ninety nine out of a hundred people listening probably don't know the guy. But somebody besides me picked up on it, and it's starting to come out. But um, yeah, I don't. I just I don't know. I think it's it's a shame because you and you are right. Like somebody's back in the day, everybody used to imitate a tell, right? The, the the way he talked and stuff. Yeah, you can definitely if you listen listen to Skanks for the memories, you could be like that launched everybody in the beginning of how they were just copying that guy, how he did his club work because it was perfect. Because you're gonna imitate the people that are great in the beginning. I get that, yeah. but you're st like you might take one thing that sounds like them. Or maybe the inflection of their voice, maybe their cadence of how they go. That's not good. You should change that. But if you wear their same clothes and you put on your Dave Attell hat yeah. and you fucking uh, call it bumping mics and call it, uh, you know, do all that stuff in your set, you're probably doing it on purpose at that point. Yeah. In which case, then you're shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I think that's going to wrap it up. Do you have anything else you want to talk about before we uh, go get ready to go see the goat? No, this has been fun. And I think that these might possibly be a worthy step in the quest for laughs. <laughs> He had the right idea, just the wrong people. <laughs> 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 <laughs>